1937, the Yankees had just won the World Series off the strength of stars Lou Gehrig, Bill Dickey, Red Ruffing, Lefty Gomez, and a 22-year-old Joe DiMaggio. DiMaggio finished second in the MVP vote, ahead of those other Yankee stars I just mentioned. As it was for every player at the time, DiMaggio went into 1938 without a contract and entered negotiations with the Yankees. Initially, he was offered $15,000, the exact same salary he had going into 1937, before his amazing season, and he reasonably countered with $40,000 saying that he wouldn't go a penny less. Yankees brass said that $40,000 was even more than the great Lou Gehrig was making, which DiMaggio responded with that Mr. Gehrig is a badly underpaid player. Funny enough, Lou Gehrig's contract demands going into 1938 was also $40,000, but for him, the Yankees countered with $39,000, much closer to his demands. The old days of baseball had something called the Reserve Clause. The Reserve Clause gave each team control of a player for life. They couldn't negotiate with other teams. If they were traded, they had no input into where they were going, and the receiving team could continue to control that player for life. Going into each year, every player would negotiate a new contract for the upcoming season. In reality, the player either accepted what the team was offering or sat out the season. There was very little wiggle room and deciding to sit out for the season would pretty much end your career because going into the next season, the same team would still have control of the player and would do the same song and dance, probably penalizing the player for sitting out the previous season. Holding out was something that just didn't happen. Yes, some players threatened to hold out, but almost all signed before spring training and certainly before opening day. This is what happened to Lou Gehrig in 1938. He ended up accepting the $39,000 offer from the Yankees in early March. However, Joe DiMaggio was intent on getting his $40,000. The Yankees owner, Colonel Jacob Rupert, eventually bumped up his offer from $15,000 to $25,000, but still quite a bit short of the $40,000 DiMaggio was demanding, and DiMaggio refused to sign. I want my $40,000! He was going to do the unthinkable and hold out past opening day. Once he started missing games, News writers and the general public, still in the midst of the Great Depression, weren't very sympathetic to a baseball player refusing to play for a sum of money they'd never see in their lifetimes. DiMaggio understood this fact later saying, times being what they are, guys sit up there and think, there's that big bum crabbing about making 25,000 a year, and we can't even get 1,000. Another slap in the face was the fact that Gehrig did sign for 39,000, a seemingly strategic move by the Yankees to make DiMaggio's demand for 40,000 seem unreasonable. Public sentiment turned on DiMaggio. Only a few games into the year, he agreed to the $25,000. But the Yankees added a stipulation that he would have to pay for his own conditioning and training to get in game shape and wouldn't receive a paycheck until it was deemed he was game ready, costing him $162 a day. DiMaggio didn't play in games until the 13th day of the season, losing him close to $2,000, and was booed by Yankees fans in his first at bat. Yankees manager Joe McCarthy said of DiMaggio after he signed, I am particularly happy he has seen the light for his own good. He has just avoided making the biggest mistake of his life. The message was clear. If you decided to hold out, you would get punished and it would not end well. Fast forward to today. In the last two years, we've seen the largest contract in baseball history, the largest contract for a player with only two years of service time, the largest contract for a player with only one year of service time, and the largest contract for a player that has never even played a game in the majors. Adjusting for inflation, all of these contracts are many, many orders of magnitude larger than what DiMaggio was even asking for, much less what he actually got paid. Even the league minimum today is more than DiMaggio's inflation-adjusted salary in 1938. Players have way more negotiating power through things that didn't exist in DiMaggio's time, such as arbitration, free agency, professional agents that negotiate on their behalf, and a players' union that gives a lot more power to the players. This didn't happen overnight. How we got from DiMaggio to today is a long story that has its share of pioneers and martyrs, victories and missteps, unions and collusion, federal court cases, and even some funny or weird moments. My hope here is to tell that tale, go through the major inflection points, and really detail how and why so much changed when it comes to baseball contracts. And we'll start digging into it after the intro.
I opened with DiMaggio to show that even stubborn star players willing to hold out to get higher pay still got the short end of the stick and were, for the most part, stuck to making whatever the owners personally thought was reasonable. The owners also had a heck of a racket to keep this control, from sports writers that took the owner's side and painted any players trying to negotiate as greedy, to even the players themselves. Today we know exactly what each player makes, but in the old days, it was taboo to tell anyone. If players told their fellow teammates what they made and how their negotiations were going, the owners would use that against them and not only offer them less in negotiations, but potentially cut their playing time, issue threats, or just make life difficult. Because of this, there's very few sources that go into the nitty gritty of negotiations prior to the 1970s. Even through the 70s and 80s, some players would still not discuss what they made or make it public. In my arbitration extension analysis for my previous video, I had to exclude a lot of contracts because the salary details just didn't exist. A common phrase I'd run into is, terms of the contract were not disclosed. Because of this, it's incredibly hard to get details of what went on in these negotiations. But luckily, we have the book Ball Four. Written by pitcher Jim Bouton to chronicle his 1969 season with the Seattle Pilots, he starts the book going into detail on his contract negotiations throughout the 60s with the Yankees. Now, Bowen was very business savvy for a baseball player, later becoming co-founder of Big League Chew. Big League Chew inventor and business partner Rob Nelson said of Bowton, Jim was a savvy businessman. He was the bulldog, the detail guy. You need that. Anybody can have an idea, but unless you have a Jim Bowton, you know, Jim is like Colonel Parker to Elvis. There'd be no Elvis without Colonel Parker. Jim pounded the pavement. He went to six or eight companies and he pitched the brand. They would say, we don't make anything like that. And Jim would say, exactly. That's why I'm saying maybe you should. The other thing about Bowden is he was not afraid to speak his mind. In Ball Four, he covered topics about life in a baseball clubhouse that just weren't talked about. Things like drugs and the use of greenies to an in-depth look at beaver shooting with Mickey Mantle. No, I won't explain what that means. You're gonna have to read the book. But most important for this video is his contract negotiations from 1962 to 1966. Roy Haney, the general manager, came into the clubhouse and shoved a contract under my nose. Here's your contract, he said. Sign it. Everybody gets 7000 their first year. Dan Topping Jr., son of the owner, said, Just sign here, on the bottom line. I unfolded the contract and it was for $9,000. If I made the team. I get 7,000 if I didn't. Don't forget your World Series share, Topping said. Fine, I said. I'll sign a contract that guarantees me 10,000 more at the end of the season if we don't win the pennant. He was shocked. Oh, oh, we can't do that. Then what advantage is it for me to take less money? That's what we're offering. I can't sign it. Then you'll have to go home. All right, I'll go home. I called him the next morning. We decided to eliminate the contingency clause. You get 9,000 whether you make the club or not. Wow, I said. Then I said no. That's our final offer. Take it or leave it. You know, people don't usually do this. You're the first holdout we've had in I don't know how many years. Haney said he wanted to talk to me. You don't sign that contract, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Where have we heard this sentiment before? Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. I said I wouldn't sign. All right, how much do you want? I was thinking about 12,000, I said. Out of the question, tell you what, we'll give you 10,000. My heart jumped. Make it 10,5, I said. All right, 10,5. Hauk offered me 15000 How many guys have you had who won 21 games in their second year, I asked him. Two weeks before spring training, he came up another 1000 to 16500 I want 20000 We never double contracts. It's a rule. It's a rule he made up right there, I'd bet. The day before spring training began, he went up another 2000 to 18500 I said, I might have signed this contract if you had come with it sooner. And if I hadn't had the problem I had last year trying to get 3000 But I can't, because it's become a matter of principle. On March 8th, Hauk called me and said he was going to deduct $100 a day from his offer for every day I held out beyond March 10th. I chickened out. I found this article from 1964 that goes into a little more detail. Before accepting the Yankees' last figure, Bouton checked baseball and legal sources to see if there was any course if he turned it down. He discovered he had none. They had me over a barrel, he said. I couldn't afford to lose $100 a day. I had a wife and a baby. Well, what do you want? Ordinarily, I'd say winning 18 and two in the series would be worth about an $8,000 raise. Good, I'll send you a contract calling for 26.5. But in view of what's happened last year and the year before that, it'll have to be more. How much more? At least 30. We couldn't do that. It's out of the question. Couple of days later, he called again. Does 28,000 sound fair to you? 
Yes, it does. Very fair. In fact, there are a lot of fair figures. 28, 29, 30, 32. I'd say 33 would be too high and 27 on down would be unfair on your part. So you're prepared to sign now? Not yet. I haven't decided. A week later, he called again and said he'd sent me the contract I wanted. $28,000. Now, wait a minute. I didn't say I'd sign for that, but you said it was a fair figure. Are you going back on your word, trying to pull a fast one on me? By now, he's shouting, God damn it, you're trying to renege on the deal. So I shouted back, who the hell do you people think you are? Trying to bully people around? You have a goddamn one-way contract and you won't let a guy negotiate. What's an extra thousand or two to the New York Yankees? As soon as people find out the kind of numbers you're talking about, they realize how mean and stupid you are. Okay, you get your 30. Under one condition, you don't tell anybody you're getting it. The day the contract was signed, a very pro-owner article reported the contract at 29,000. General Manager Ralph Houck, ex-major, ex-army ranger, and all that sort of thing, and pitcher Jim Bouton, last name spelled stubborn with accent on the second syllable, Bouton took the 29,000. The next day, the amount was corrected to 30,000 as Bouton truthfully told the press what he made when asked. When I got my contract, it called for $23,000, a $7,000 cut. But Ralph, I was injured and you said you weren't injured. How come you pitched 150 innings? I was trying to do what I could, trying to help the team. I know that people think you lost the battle with me last year. I'll make a deal with you. Cut me $3,000 and we can both be happy. He said, okay. After that, it was all downhill, which is how come I'm happy to be making 22,000 with the Seattle Pilots in 1969. You can see the problem here. When a player pitches well, ownership will fight them on raises. When a player has a bad year, their pay gets cut without a second thought. Every player is signing contracts one year at a time. There's no guarantee of anything if you come down with a career-ending injury. Every year, each player has in the back of their mind that it might be the highest salary they ever make in their career. Bowden's highest pay came in 1965, when he was just 26 years old. If he hadn't driven a hard bargain, one that he describes as losing, he probably would have made way less than he ended up making. After Ball 4 was released, along with its follow-up, I'm glad you didn't take it personally, Bowden faced a lot of backlash from the league. He covered why in a forward written later. The team owners became furious and wanted to ban the book. Commissioner Bowie Ayatollah Kuhn called me in for a reprimand and announced that I had done the game a grave disservice. Sports writers called me names like traitor and turncoat. The ballplayers, most of them who hadn't read it, picked up the cue. The San Diego Padres burned the book and left the charred remains for me to find in the visitor's clubhouse. While I was on the mound trying to pitch, players on the opposing teams hollered obscenities at me. I can still remember Pete Rose on the top step of the dugout screaming, fuck you, Shakespeare. The owners, for their part, saw this as economically dangerous. And of course, the baseball owners were upset, um, but not because locker room stories and, you know, behind the scenes secrets, but um, the owners were upset with Ball 4 because it was the first book to tell people how difficult it was to make a living in baseball. It changed, my, I think what I'm most proud of, I think it changed the perception of how people felt about ball players in terms of you know making a lot of money that they made a lot of money they didn't and it showed that baseball players were basically mistreated by the owners the owners knew that public opinion was important in maintaining the controversial reserve clause which teams used to control players and hold down salaries they lived in fear that this special exemption might someday be overturned the yankees also did their part banning bowden from attending any old timers days in 1998, after the death of Boughton's daughter in a car accident, his son, Michael Boughton, wrote an open letter to the Yankees in the New York Times on Father's Day, pleading for them to invite his father for that year's Old Timers Day. This past August, my sister Lori died in an automobile crash at the age of 31. She was beautiful and sweet, and as tough as it is to lose a sibling, I cannot even fathom the loss my parents must feel. I know that not having Old Timers Day on our calendar like a holiday gave us fewer days with Lori. It's been nearly 30 years since my father wrote Ball Four. And for all of the hullabaloo about his book, the major detractors have all written their own tell-all books, affirming the validity of what they once called lies. Last year, on the occasion of its 100th anniversary, the New York Public Library listed Ball Four as one of the 100 most important books of the century. The question is this, why do the Yankees still feel as if they have to punish him? I'm hoping to reach George Steinbrenner's sons. Despite our different upbringings, I think we have a lot in common. It's never easy growing up the child of a public figure. I know they have heard mean things said about their father, much as the same way I have. I think there have been days when they have been publicly embarrassed by him, 
And there have been times when they have been as proud as any child has ever been about a parent, exactly like me. I'm sure they love their father as much as I love mine. That is what Father's Day is about, celebrating that love. I see this as an opportunity to get my father some extra hugs at a time in his life when he could use all the hugs he can get. Remember the Yankee whose hat fell off when he delivered his high hard one? This Yankee had a couple of years when the hat was really flying off. He rang up 21 victories in 1963. That's one of the highlights of his 10-year Major League career. He's an accomplished author, a broadcaster, and we welcome him back to Yankee Stadium. Jim Bowden. Going into 1966, the world champion Dodgers had a bit of a problem on their hands. It seemed like a good problem on paper. They had two of the best starting pitchers in the league, future Hall of Famers Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. They finished second and fifth in the MVP voting respectively with Koufax winning unanimous Cy Young. The good is obvious. The bad, they were both intent on negotiating for contracts rivaling the largest in the league, which at the time was Willie Mays making $105,000. Buzzy Bavese, general manager of the Dodgers, was notorious for some underhanded tactics when it came to negotiating with players. In a Sports Illustrated article he wrote in 1967, Bavese went into detail on some of those tactics. Tommy Davis had just won the National League batting championship, and the next day I told my secretary, Edna Ward, to fix me up a phony contract calling for $9,000 for Tommy Davis. I told Edna, now when that stubborn kid comes into my office today, wait about 10 minutes and then call me outside so I can leave him in there alone. I carefully put Davis's contract on my desk where it could be seen, and I marked its exact position. The kid came in, and he and I talked for a while, and then Edna came in and said, Mr. O'Malley wants to see you for a minute. Oh, excuse me, I said, and stepped out. I gave it about five minutes, then I coughed loudly and walked back into my office. Sure enough, the fake contract had been moved, and all of a sudden the kid was saying, all right, Buzzy, maybe I'm being unreasonable. He said he would sign for $12,000. When it came to negotiating with Koufax and Drysdale, who were both seeking contracts over six figures, Bavese had penciled in $90,000 for Drysdale and $100,000 for Koufax before negotiations began. His main tactic is when Koufax would say a large number, he'd say, Drysdale isn't even asking for that amount. When Drysdale would say a large number, he'd say, Koufax isn't even asking for that amount. The only problem, Koufax and Drysdale were close friends ever since they went through basic training together at Fort Dix, New Jersey in the late 1950s. One night, over dinner, they discussed how negotiations were going and realized Bavese was playing them off each other. They saw only one solution to this. They would negotiate together, as a pair, and only agree to contracts, as a pair. This created an issue for the Dodgers. Kovacs and Drysdale were responsible for 43.6% of the total innings pitched by the team in 1965. One star player holding out, yeah, you can deal with that past opening day and get them to eventually cave. But two? Adding to Bavese's issues in dealing with Kovacs and Drysdale, Drysdale's wife Ginger was an actress that had an agent. She was flabbergasted that baseball players didn't have agents. She put them in contact with her agent, Bill Hayes, and Koufax and Drysdale decided they would negotiate through Hayes. Bavese said this was a hard line for him and he would not and never did negotiate with a third party. Koufax wrote in his autobiography that Bavese did negotiate with Hayes, but Bavese vehemently denies this. For him, he realized the danger and leverage that an agent more familiar with the business side of things brought in these negotiations. There was danger in dealing with an agent, and the Dodgers said it was a hard line they would not cross. Whether Bavese actually negotiated with Hayes in any meaningful manner depends on the source you read. Koufax claims he did, Bavese claims he didn't. The initial request from Koufax and Drysdale floored Bavese, a three-year deal worth $1 million, between the two of them an average of about $167,000 a year. Bavese said he would never offer a multi-year contract, which, to his credit, what would be the point of teams giving out multi-year contracts when the reserve clause exists? And he said he would not do one contract split between two players. 
Within a week, the Dodgers had reportedly offered a counteroffer of $125,000 for Koufax and $100,000 for Drysdale. Although this is highly questionable because a few weeks after that, it was reported the Dodgers' final offer was $110,500 for Koufax and $97,500 for Drysdale. You'll find this all over the place in the media around this time where numbers don't really line up with the real story when it comes to contract negotiations. As we saw with Jim Bouton, and we will see in this story, even the final contract amounts after an agreement is made don't always line up. How much of this is the owners spinning a tail to reporters to make their side look better during negotiations or to save face if they lost? And how much of this is just bad reporting? It's difficult to tell. Koufax and Drysdale didn't want to mess with the media. They offered no interviews or statements to the press during the holdout, so nearly everything we see in the news comes directly from the Dodgers. But Koufax and Drysdale did have a few tricks up their sleeves. They signed a deal with Paramount Pictures to star in the movie Warning Shot if their holdout extended into the regular season, indicating that an extended holdout was a real possibility. But the real scare to owners is when their agent Bill Hayes realized a California law was on the books that made it illegal to extend personal service contracts beyond seven years. A law that was to protect Hollywood actors from predatory movie studio contracts. Both Koufax and Drysdale had been with the Dodgers for seven years, and this law might render the reserve clause illegal in California. Hayes began preparing a lawsuit to challenge the reserve clause in late March. The reserve clause getting struck down in court was the worst case scenario for all the owners, and Bavese, being tipped off about the potential lawsuit, went into a full panic realizing he needed to end the holdout as quickly as possible. Bavese had an emergency meeting with Drysdale, who said Koufax had given him the okay to finalize the deal on his behalf, and signed the pair for 1966. Koufax making $125,000 and Drysdale making $115,000, which the newspapers got wrong again and reported the amounts as $120,000 and $110,000 respectively. Again, how much of this is bad reporting and how much of this is the owners purposefully rounding down to try to save face is anyone's guess. That said, Bavese still admitted defeat. If you had to pick a winner in the whole argument, you'd have to say it was Drysdale and Koufax. Donald got a $30,000 raise and Sandy got a $40,000 raise, and neither would have commanded that much money negotiating alone. After all, they got the biggest raises in baseball history. To that extent, the double holdout worked, although they gave in on the three-year contract for $1 million, which I don't think they ever meant anyway. But as I said before, the plan only worked because the greatest pitcher in baseball was in on it. And also, they caught us by surprise. As a side note about Buzzy Bavese, it's quite funny that in the set of articles he wrote in 1967, he painted himself as a master contract negotiator that was able to get what he needed out of the players. However, his exit from the Dodgers shows he may have been a little too confident in his abilities. Bavese's contract was about to expire, so he gathered his courage and went to see the old man as he referred to O'Malley. The Tsar of Los Angeles considered Bavese's request and said, you've done a fine job, but your timing stinks. We lost $2 million last year. Not until later, when Bavese moved to the expansion franchise in San Diego, did he discover that two years earlier the Dodgers had netted a profit of more than four million. When O'Malley said, we lost two million dollars, he meant, of course, that there had been two million dollars less in profits than the year before. Koufax and Drysdale showed the power the players had if they negotiated as a combined front. As a union, you might say. And developments in the background during this 1966 holdout followed suit. There was a Players Association established in 1954, but this in no way resembled a union. It was more a token organization to manage the players' pension, a pension that was vastly underfunded as the players saw their retired counterparts broke and without jobs. The head of the Players Association, Robert Cannon, was said to have never met an owner he didn't like, continually reminded the players that they were the luckiest men alive to be played to pay ball, and said baseball had the finest relationship between players and management in the history of the sport. Going into 1966, the heads of the Players Association, Robin Roberts, Jim Bunning, and Harvey Keene, wanted to make it something bigger, a full-blown union, and Cannon was not the man for the job. We wanted to accomplish one big thing, talk on an equal basis with management. They searched for someone to lead the Players Association who had shown success in the past in getting workers their rights. Enter Marvin Miller. Marvin Miller had a lifetime dedicated to labor disputes. 
As economic advisor and assistant to the president of the United Steelworkers, he was instrumental in turning that union into one of the most powerful in the country. The heads of the Players Association nominated Miller as director, but he still had to be approved in a vote by all the players, which was going to be an uphill battle. To many players, union was a dirty word that conjured up images of Jimmy Hoffa. On top of that, many players had bought into the owner's argument for the reserve clause and viewed a player's union as a threat to the league's very existence. One article at the time stated, Marvin Miller, executive of the United Steelworkers Union, has been nominated as executive director of the Major League Players Association, but the ball players are definitely against him. Ron Santo of the Cubs says he'll fight to keep the union out of baseball. To try and sway the players, Miller visited every team in spring training, talking to all 600 members of the Players Association. Miller expressed frustration at how the players didn't realize that they were being screwed. When I started talking about the reserve clause, I found that players had been so brainwashed they had extreme doubts. Yankees pitcher Jim Bowden, who we've heard about before, pulled Miller aside during his visit to the Yankees and asked, how could baseball work without a reserve clause? Wouldn't the richest teams get the best players? You mean like the Yankees do now? Miller asked him. I never thought about it like that, Bowden said. Miller recalled the conversation years later. If one of the brightest players had been brainwashed to that extent, I knew the task ahead was a very large one, indeed. Miller's first team visits were in Arizona's Cactus League where the Angels, Giants, Indians, and Cubs played. The meetings did not go well, as it seemed owners had laid the groundwork to have the players be antagonistic to Miller. When the votes for those four teams came in, they overwhelmingly rejected Miller with a vote 102 to 17 against Miller becoming director. The Giants had voted unanimously 27 to 0 to reject Miller. Things were not looking good. Miller's visit to the 16 teams in Florida's Grapefruit League went significantly different. Whether it was because there were way more players in Florida that had talked to each other about the issues, or a few player reps that enthusiastically discussed the issues beforehand, the owner's grip on the players did not seem as strong in Florida. Miller said there was more engagement during Q&A sessions and an enthusiasm that didn't show up in Arizona. Grapefruit League players voted in favor of Miller 472 to 32, making the overall vote across the league a resounding win, 489 to 136. Miller was now director of the Players Association, and he knew he had his work cut out for him. I realized that uh, it was not going to be easy. I realized that uh, doing something major like reforming the reserve system was going to meet uh, tremendous opposition. Uh, but I guess I could not have anticipated the, the constant uh, confrontations that uh, have occurred in, in this period we're talking about. It was clear from the first negotiating meeting between the Players Association and the owners that the owners had no idea how collective bargaining worked. In the past, the owners had just gotten their way with little pushback, and this new experience was going to be eye-opening. In his opening statement, Commissioner Kuhn stated that the owners weren't there to talk and wouldn't make any proposals or counter-proposals of any kind. This is after the Players Association had already sent a proposal two months earlier with a detailed economic analysis that requested the league minimum salary go from $6,000 to $12,000. Kuhn's statement angered the player representatives who had taken time out of spring training to attend. If the owners weren't going to negotiate or provide counterproposals, why didn't they state that beforehand, cancel the negotiation session, and not waste everyone's time? It was the 1967 version of, this meeting could have been an email. Miller had to remind the owners that they had a statutory duty to bargain in good faith, which they clearly hadn't fulfilled, and opened up the Players Association to file an unfair labor practice charge with the National Labor Relations Board. For the next year, the owners continued to stall on any negotiations for even small changes, something the players did not react well to. The association served notice to the owners on their main negotiating points for the first collective bargaining agreement. Increased minimum salary, reduced season length from 162 games to 154, a formal grievance procedure for players, limiting of salary cuts, increase in food allowances, first-class hotel and travel accommodations, restrictions on rule changes and amendments to the standard player's contract, and modification of the reserve rules. If Miller had 489 player votes in 1966, that number had swelled to well over 600 in 1968 as the players came to realize how much they were being screwed over and how combative the owners were being on these requests. 
This proposal would raise almost 50% of the players' salaries overnight, and for a profession that contains an inordinate amount of air travel and hotel stays, making it all first class was way more important to the players than you'd think at first glance. Some of the bigger changes proposed scared the owners, especially modifications to the reserve clause and reduction of the season's length, and after a year of stalling, they finally ironed out the first collective bargaining agreement in professional sports. This included an increase in minimum salary from $6,000 to $10,000, the maximum salary cut went from 25% to 20%, spring training allowance went from $25 to $40 a week, meal money allowance went from $12 to $15 a day, and perhaps the biggest one, a formal grievance procedure so players could fight violations of their contractual rights. We'll get back to this one because it plays a major role in the future. Things went up a notch in 1969. When negotiations regarding the funding of the players' pension fund and benefits plan had stalled out, over 450 players agreed to not sign contracts going into spring training. It was the Koufax Drysdale holdout on steroids. Mickey Mantle even postponed announcing his retirement so he could be included in the list of high-profile players holding out. This was extremely effective as there was an agreement by the end of February when the first press photos from spring training were of mostly empty fields. After the agreement was reached, Mantle officially retired. The first four years of the union had been a major success, but one of the biggest challenges would come in year five. At the end of the 1969 season, St. Louis Cardinals center fielder Kurt Flood was traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. This caused a number of issues for Flood. He had spent the last 12 years in St. Louis. His family was there, his friends were there, his side business was there. He had no desire to go to Philadelphia. On top of that, the Cardinals were competitive almost through Flood's entire career, going to the World Series three times and finishing above 500 in nine out of the 12 seasons he was there. The Phillies, on the other hand, were perennial cellar dwellers, played in a dilapidated stadium, and had a racist reputation that goes back to when Jackie Robinson first played in Philadelphia. You might recall that scene from 42. He looks like a nice boy. That right boy? You don't belong here, n You hear me? Why don't you look in the mirror? This is a white man's game. All right, get that through your thick monkey skull! All of that actually happened. Flood was active in civil rights demonstrations, viewed Jackie Robinson as a hero, and had experienced his share of racism when he played in the miners in the South, as well as in his hometown of Oakland. In 1964, he leased a house in Martinez, California, a suburb of Oakland, and when the property owner found out he was black, barred him from entry with a shotgun. Flood firmly believed that baseball's reserve clause was also a civil rights issue. Do you think your race has something to do with your taking this strong a stand? Well, yes I do. Me as a black man, I'm probably a lot more sensitive to the rights of other people because I have been denied these rights. If you're a man who makes $90,000 a year, which isn't exactly slave wages, what you were taught to that? Well, uh, Howard, I'm... Uh, a well-paid slave is nonetheless a slave. He met with Marvin Miller in New York on his intention to sue for his free agency. Miller was blunt to Flood. There was a one in a million chance that Flood would win. Even if he did win, he would be blacklisted from baseball. The second he filed that lawsuit, his baseball career was over no matter the outcome. In Miller's mind, getting rid of the reserve clause was a long-term goal, but the Players Association had a long way to go until that was possible. That said, Miller did tell Flood that if he did sue, the Players Association would back him fully with resources, cover legal fees, and provide as much support as possible. You didn't really want Flood to bring that case at that time, did you? It was not one that we had planned. Uh, this was Kurt Flood's idea, pure and simple. I know a lot of the owners felt that oh, we had engineered the whole thing. The timing of it was not right. But we couldn't uh, just let him go off on his own. It was too important. And so we made it part of our case, as it were. The one question Flood had is, would this help other players? When Miller responded yes, Flood said, then let's do it. Flood was going into this situation with his eyes open to what it would mean to him, potentially ruining him, and he still wanted to go through with it because it was the right thing to do. 
Now, why was this a losing battle? To put it bluntly, legal precedent. The Reserve Clause came into being in 1879. Congress passed the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, something that would seem to make the Reserve Clause illegal, but in 1922, the Supreme Court ruled that Major League Baseball was exempt from this act because it was entertainment and not interstate commerce. The Reserve Clause was challenged in 1947 by Danny Gardella, one of the many players that had signed to play in Mexico for more money, which prompted Major League Baseball to institute a five-year ban for any players that went to Mexico in order to remove competition. Gardella sued, but after a federal court upheld the 1922 Supreme Court decision that baseball was not interstate commerce, Gardella reached a settlement with the league as a drawn-out appeals process and trial would be costly and have little chance of success. There was another challenge to the Reserve Clause in 1951, when Yankees minor leaguer Earl Toulson felt his path to the majors was blocked because he was in the highly talented Yankee system and seek to sign with another team. He sued Major League Baseball, but once again, the Supreme Court upheld the precedent that baseball was not interstate commerce. All of this is nonsensical. No other professional sport is deemed to not be interstate commerce, and it didn't make sense that somehow baseball wasn't. But precedent is powerful in the legal system. If you have something that the Supreme Court already ruled on twice in the past 50 years, with the most recent being only 20 years ago, regardless of what it is, it's going to be much harder to overturn. Miller knew this. Flood knew this. Miller called it a million to one shot, but Flood stuck to his principles. After predictably losing in federal district court and appeals court, Flood's case went to the Supreme Court, who, surprisingly, initially ruled 4-4 to four with one justice abstaining. But Chief Justice Warren Burger, most known as being the inspiration behind my second place finishing bar trivia team, Warren Burger in Paradise, changed his vote from for Flood to against to make the final decision 5-3 to three in favor of Major League Baseball. Bob Woodward of the Washington Post suggested that this vote change was to allow recently appointed Justice Harry Blackman to write an opinion. Writing an important Supreme Court opinion can be viewed as a career-defining moment, and any 4-4 four to four decision would not have a majority opinion. Marvin Miller wrote of this, If Woodward's versions of events were true in any significant part, it certainly would not enhance the perception of the integrity of the court. Vote trading is not considered beneath congressmen, but the U.S. Supreme Court? But what happened to Flood? He didn't play for the Phillies for an entire season, the entire time receiving hate mail and getting ripped apart in the press. One of Flood's negative attributes was he wasn't very good with money and before too long, he had racked up quite a bit of debt. He was also an alcoholic who spent his year out of baseball drinking and chain smoking. Philadelphia eventually traded him to the Washington Senators who offered him 110,000 to play in 1971. Heavily in debt, Flood decided to take the offer. I haven't really changed my philosophy about the whole thing, but uh, sometimes you have to do things that aren't tasteful. The year of drinking and smoking had taken its toll, and an out-of-shape Flood only played 13 games with the Senators before he decided he didn't have it anymore and left the team. And in the midst of bankruptcy, he left the country to live in Mallorca, Spain, where he opened a bar. He returned to baseball briefly as a radio color commentator for the Oakland Athletics in 1978, but he was reportedly not very good at the job and his contract was not renewed after the first year. He was diagnosed with throat cancer in 1995, passing in 1997 at the age of 59. What of his legacy? For years, he was essentially ostracized from the baseball community, but after the reserve clause was abolished in 1975, free agency became widespread and salaries increased dramatically. People began to realize the importance of what Flood did. He started to get more recognition and a welcoming response from the baseball community in the early 90s, until his death. For me, whenever I'm asked who's the biggest snub in the history of the Baseball Hall of Fame, my answer isn't Lou Whitaker, Kenny Lofton, Dave Steeb, or a number of other candidates. No, my go-to answer is Kurt Flood, and it isn't even close. Since Jackie Robinson, he had the biggest impact of any player, not just for baseball, but all professional sports. Similar labor movements for NFL, NBA, and NHL didn't take off until the years following the flood case. 
In 2020, there was a letter sent to the Baseball Hall of Fame endorsed by the Major League Baseball Players Association, the National Basketball Players Association, the National Football League Players Association, the National Hockey League Players Association, the Major League Soccer Players Association, and signed by over 100 members of Congress, urging them to put Kurt Flood in the hall. Now, some of you out there might be saying, but Flood lost the case. It was players that came after him that oversaw the abolishment of the reserve clause and the birth of free agency. While true, what Flood did was to bring all of this to the forefront of the public. Nobody had any idea what the reserve clause was in 1968. In 1970, the reserve clause was front page news. It also raised awareness among the players themselves, as more and more of them got on board with the Players Association's goals. Ultimately, what do we remember more? Do we remember the Battle of the Alamo or the Battle of San Jacinto? Do we remember William Wallace or Robert the Bruce? The guy that sticks his head out alone and loses everything and inspires everyone else to do what they do later is the bigger figure. Flood took a losing battle against the Supreme Court, against all advice, that was going to destroy him because it was the right thing to do and it inspired everyone that came after. We had a surplus in the uh, pension fund because of higher interest rates and things. And it, it had generated more money than we had anticipated. And we felt we should be able to use that money to buy more uh, retirement benefits for ourselves. The owners would not let us use that money. It's our money. It's in our pension fund. But uh, according to labor law, you can't do it without their consent. But they, uh, they wouldn't give us consent to use that money. Well, with all the ramifications, uh, ramifications of the entire thing, you have to deduce that there's an ulterior motive for this thing. And I, I would think that uh, they were trying to test initially to see how strong we are as an organization. After we did strike, they wanted to uh, uh, try and break us. For years, the owners, along with the commissioner, had complete control over the league. From 1966 to 1971, the players' union continued to whittle those powers away, raising the minimum salary, securing more funding for the pension plan and health care, instituting a grievance system that would go in front of an independent arbitrator who would rule against the owners and the commissioner from time to time. It was the first time up to that point the owners were told no. In every CBA negotiation, the players came out with more power and rights than they had going in. This made the owners desperate for a win, desperate for a way to crush the union. Going into 1972, their thinking was, if we don't compromise on whatever the next issue is, regardless of what the next issue is, and force the players to strike as a last resort, the players would cave. There's no way the players would give up paychecks when most of their careers are relatively short and with no guarantee that they'd be in the league for more than a year or two. The owners also believed the players striking would turn public opinion against the players as it would be viewed as greedy. What's important is, it didn't matter to the owners what the issue would be. They would hold their ground on the next Players Association demands no matter what. The next demand by the players was for pension plan payouts to match the 17% cost of living increase since they last renewed the pension plan three years prior. The funniest thing about this demand is the pension plan had a surplus, meaning this wouldn't require any additional funds from the owners. The money was already there. The players just wanted access to it. The owners said no. Marvin Miller wrote of the refusal to agree to this. Management was baiting us into a strike. Their position was, take it or leave it. There is nothing you or the players can do about it. Cardinals owner Gussie Bush announced to the press, we voted unanimously to take a stand. We're not going to give them another goddamn cent. If they want to strike, let them strike. Miller wrote of this, of all his confrontational statements, this may have been the dumbest. It became a rallying point for the players, a factor in the rapidly spreading solidarity against the owner's arbitrary anti-player position. New York Post columnist Dick Young wrote, clearly to the owners, the enemy is not the players, whom the owners regard merely as ingrates, misled ingrates. The enemy is Marvin Miller, general of the union. The showdown is with him. It's not over a few more thousand dollars, not the few thousand demanded for some obscure pension inflation. It is over the principle of who will run their baseball business. A strike was on the table and it was up to the players to vote for it. The owners thought there was no way they would strike, but to show how out of touch they were with the players, the players voted 663 to 10 to strike. Even at this point, the owners thought the players would cave, but they were very wrong. 
In a series of negotiating meetings between the sides, even Marvin Miller was surprised at the solidarity the players displayed. The players were more committed to accepting the owner's challenge to strike than I had realized. In fact, they were positively militant. Soon I found myself playing the role of devil's advocate, trying to be as realistic, even pessimistic, as possible. I pointed out that we had no strike funds, no field offices, and no public relations staff. The press would likely be hostile, and on and on, to no avail. Player after player stood up to convince me that they were united, that they were hell-bent on taking the fight to the owners, even though it was impossible to know how long the strike would last. The strike was on, the first strike in professional sports. Within a week, the owners were already starting to crack. Gussie Bush, the owner that proclaimed to not give them another goddamn cent, was reported to have said that the club should band together to raise a $1 million emergency fund to help the poorer teams during the strike. Supposedly, Walter O'Malley, owner of the Dodgers, shot back, You idiot, the Dodgers alone lose $1 million each weekend the strike goes on. Finally, on April 13th, the 13th day of the strike, the owners fully agreed to the player's proposal. Leonard Copper of the New York Times summed up baseball's first strike like this. Players, we want higher pensions. Owners, we won't give you one damn cent for that. Players, you don't have to. The money is already there. Just let us use it. Owners, it would be imprudent. Players, we did it before. And anyhow, we won't play unless we can have some of it. Owners, okay. Between the last two statements, 13 days elapsed, 86 games went unplayed, the owners lost an estimated 5.2 million, and Major League players lost nine days salary, or about $600,000. Most importantly, the owners' plan to break the solidarity between the players and crush the union had the opposite effect. Their irrational stance and unwillingness to compromise created more solidarity among the players, way more than the owners had amongst themselves. The owners couldn't simply go, no, we don't like that, and get their way anymore. Recall back to earlier in this video, I said this, a formal grievance procedure so players could fight violations of their contractual rights. We'll get back to this one because it plays a major role in the future. What was viewed as a relatively minor concession by the owners in 1968 comes in huge over the next few years. As we saw with Kurt Flood, fighting a grievance in court or in Congress with their legal precedents and politics could be a messy and losing battle with huge legal fees. Meanwhile, for binding arbitration, any grievance is brought before an independent arbitrator with a very quick turnaround on a decision that both the owners and the players association are bound to whatever the outcome is. This provided the best route for the players association to challenge the reserve clause. But before they did that, there was the test case of Catfish Hunter. Jim Catfish Hunter played for the Oakland A's from 1968 to 1974 and was one of the league's best starting pitchers in that time. He was the league Cy Young in 1974 where he won 25 games and pitched 23 complete games. But he had an issue with A's owner Charlie Finley. This started in 1969 when Finley gave Hunter a loan of $150,000 to buy farmland in North Carolina with the repayment plan over the next eight years. Only months after giving Hunter the loan, Finley demanded he pay it back in full immediately because Finley needed the money to fund the purchase of both a hockey and a basketball team. Obviously, Hunter didn't have the money because he'd already bought the land. He ended up having to sell off some of the land to pay Finley the full $150,000 back, something that made Hunter very bitter towards ownership. Flash forward to the 1974 season. Hunter signed a $100,000 contract prior to the season, stipulating $50,000 would be normal in-season payments and $50,000 would be towards a deferred annuity life insurance plan with payments on the same schedule as normal in-season payments. The A's agreed to this, but once the season started, Finley found out those life insurance payments were not tax deductible until Hunter would receive the annuity payments years down the line. Finley was not a fan of this, so he decided to just not make those payments, which was a breach of contract. In September, the Players Association gave Finley written notice of contract violation, saying he had 10 days to remedy it. Finley didn't respond, so they sent notice to Finley that the contract was terminated and told the commissioner that Catfish Hunter was now a free agent. Realizing his mistake, Finley offered Hunter $50,000, but not to the life insurance policy as laid out in the contract. Hunter declined the money and filed a formal grievance against Major League Baseball. Now here's where that binding arbitration comes into play. The grievance goes in front of an independent arbitrator, in this case Peter Seitz. 
who had full authority to rule on the matter. He could rule that Hunter take the 50000 and the contract was still valid, and both the League and Players Association would have to abide by that. Or he could rule that the A's were in breach of contract and Hunter is a free agent. Seitz's final ruling was groundbreaking. The A's would have to pay the 50000 to the life insurance policy as stipulated in the contract, and the A's ability to use the reserve clause to renew Hunter's contract was forfeit. He was now a free agent who could sign with any team. Seitz's is ruling finished with, Mr. Finley's refusal to accept the insurance company as the person, firm, or corporation designated by Mr. Hunter, to which the compensation should be paid as deferred compensation, constituted a violation of the special covenant and justified its termination by Mr. Hunter. This made Catfish Hunter the first free agent in baseball history, and the bidding war was eye-opening. Nobody had any idea how much Hunter would sign for. The A's offered a one-year deal at $200,000, which Hunter nearly accepted on advice from his agent, until the Players Association advised him to at least see what the other teams were offering. There were at least eight teams that Hunter was considering at the 11th hour before signing a deal with the New York Yankees. I have to put into perspective how bonkers this contract ended up being. The highest paid player in the league in 1974 was Dick Allen at $250,000. Hunter's contract in 1974 was $100,000. Catfish Hunter signed a five-year deal at $3.2 million. That's $640,000 a year, more than double the highest salary the previous season, and more than six times what Hunter was paid the previous year. And it's reported that the Yankees didn't even offer the largest deal with four teams outbidding New York. Put yourself in the shoes of the players at this time. If they already thought the reserve clause was unfair and limiting their potential pay, Catfish Hunter's contract made that crystal clear. Getting rid of the reserve clause and allowing free agency for all players just became the most important agenda item for the players. And they wouldn't have to wait long. At this point, I think it's important to look at the exact wording of the reserve clause. If prior to March 1, the player and the club have not agreed upon the terms of such contract, then on or before 10 days after said March 1, the club shall have the right by written notice to the player to renew this contract for the period of one year on the same term. What this means is if a player made $50,000 one year and the next year doesn't agree to a contract with the team, the team can renew the $50,000 contract for that year. The big unanswered and untested question is, if the player doesn't sign a contract for the year after that, can the team renew the 50000 contract a second time? Since the player didn't agree to another contract containing the reserve clause, it seems that initial contract only gives the team the right to renew a contract for one year. This was the question in 1975 with Messersmith and McNally, and binding arbitration gave the means to answer that question. Andy Messersmith was a very good pitcher for the Dodgers, finishing second in the Cy Young in 1974 and fifth in the Cy Young in 1975. Going into 1975, Messersmith wanted the inclusion of a no-trade clause in his contract, which the Dodgers refused. Instead of coming to an agreement and sign Messersmith to a new contract, the Dodgers opted to renew his 1974 contract in line with the reserve clause. Marvin Miller, aware that Messersmith was playing under a renewed contract, monitored the situation closely and discussed with Messersmith the possibility of filing a grievance at the end of the year. Messersmith was adamant the entire season that if the Dodgers included a no-trade clause, he would sign a new contract, completely avoiding the issue. Miller was eager for a player to play under a renewed contract for an entire season so the Players Association could challenge the reserve clause in arbitration, but knowing all the Dodgers had to do to avoid that situation was include a no-trade clause at some point before the end of the season to get Messersmith to sign, Miller looked for a backup option. Dave McNally was traded from the Orioles to the Expos prior to the 1975 season. He didn't come to an agreement on a contract with Montreal, had wrist issues partway through the year, had a job outside of baseball lined up, and decided to walk away from the game and retire. But again, he never signed a contract for the 1975 season, which he did play in. He would be the perfect backup option to Messersmith. With no intention to play in the majors again, the league had no way to blacklist him or to retaliate against him. Miller asked McNally if he could add him to the grievance as a backup option in case the Dodgers came to their senses and offered Messersmith a no-trade clause causing Messersmith to sign. 
McNally, who was previously a player rep and very pro-union, agreed to be included. The Players Association ended up not needing the backup option, as on the last day of the 1975 season, with the Dodgers still not offering Messersmith a no-trade clause, the Players Association filed a formal grievance on behalf of both Messersmith and McNally. At this point, the possibility of the reserve clause being overturned sunk in for the owners. The Expo's general manager, John McHale, randomly ran into McNally in Billings, Montana, and even though McNally was intent on retiring, McHale offered him a contract on the spot for $125,000 for 1976, with a $25,000 signing bonus that he'd get regardless if he didn't make it past spring training. Marvin Miller said of this, the fact that they were willing to pay a disabled pitcher more than $100,000 not to go to arbitration told me that somebody knew how much more was at stake. McNally turned down the offer stating, McHale wasn't honest with me last year and I'm not gonna trust him again. It's tempting to show up in spring training for 25 grand, but I have no intention of playing and it wouldn't be right to take the money. Peter Seitz, the arbitrator in the Catfish Hunter grievance a year prior, would again be the arbitrator for Messersmith and McNally. After hearing both sides, Seitz wrote a 61-page decision that concluded nothing in the reserve clause said the contract could be renewed for more than one year, and Messersmith and McNally were free to negotiate and sign with other teams. Seitz was fired by the owners the very next day, but the decision had already been made and the reserve clause was no more. Seitz said of the owners afterwards, I begged them to negotiate, but the owners were too stubborn and stupid. They were like French barons in the 12th century. They had accumulated so much power, they wouldn't share it with anybody. McNally retired after the decision, just like he was intending, and Messersmith became a free agent. He made $90,000 in 1975 with the Dodgers. He signed a three-year deal for $1,333,000 a year with the Braves. Just like Catfish Hunter, Messersmith showed the value of free agency, making almost four times his previous salary and with a guaranteed contract for three years. He would have to play for over a decade at Cy Young caliber production under the old system to make as much as he did in just those three years. But the biggest thing of all was the ruling that if you didn't sign a contract for one season, you would be a free agent the next season. You can guess what's going to happen next. Spring training in 1976, almost 350 players had not signed contracts, setting up the possibility that over half the league would be free agents in 1977. The owners obviously didn't want this and were eager to come up with a solution to free agency. The players had won the right to free agency, now the goal was to set up a system that defined the requirements to be a free agent and not the chaos that looked to be happening. What do you do if you're the owners and you need the Players Association to come to an agreement on an important issue in a CBA renewal year? You do the owner's version of a strike, a lockout. The owner's initial proposal was for a player to be eligible for free agency after 10 years, plus pretty significant compensation for the team losing a free agent. A non-starter for the Players Association as only 4% of players even made it to 10 years in the league. Just like for the 1972 strike, it seemed the players were more united than the owners and the lockout was lifted after only 17 days and spring training facilities opened on March 17th. It looked like the season would start without an agreed upon CBA. In late May, with no resolution in sight, the league and the Players Association agreed to negotiate for the next two months. The heads of each met at the Biltmore Hotel in New York nearly every day. Throughout this entire time, the Players Association had the better hand with the threat that 350 players, still with unsigned contracts, would be free agents for 1977. On July 12th, the day before the All-Star Game, an agreement was finally reached. Players would require six years of service time before being eligible for free agency, with the caveat that a player with five years of service time had the right to demand a trade before his sixth year, while designating six clubs that he wouldn't accept a trade to and if he wasn't traded by March 15th prior to his sixth year, he could declare for free agency. And with that, 1977 became the first year with widespread free agency, with 32 players filing, headlined by Reggie Jackson, Bobby Gritch, Gene Tennants, Sal Bando, and Dave Cash. Every one of those players saw a significant pay raise from 1976. 1977 to 1981 saw the largest growth in player salaries for any five-year period in baseball history. This was mostly due to free agency. In 1978, of the top nine salaries in the league, eight of them were recently signed free agent contracts. 
Mike Schmidt's extension was the lone exception. But salary arbitration, something won by the Players Association in 1974, also played a role. In salary arbitration, an arbitrator makes a decision for a player's one-year contract. In order to do that, they look at what other players with similar production are making around the league. Large free agent contracts drove the potential arbitration number up for each player as it reset the market, and higher arbitration salaries also drove up future arbitration and free agent salaries. Every large contract signed created a positive feedback loop that made future contracts even larger. This is why the players settled on six years for free agency instead of holding out for fewer. Even though they had all the negotiating power, with potentially half the league becoming free agents, Marvin Miller realized that if every player became a free agent, it would oversupply the market and actually not increase salaries as much because mid to lower tier players wouldn't see the lucrative offers. Having a smaller stream of top caliber free agents resetting the market each year, in combination with salary arbitration following that market, was, in his opinion, the optimal strategy. And the massive increase in salaries we saw during this time frame seemed to confirm that. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for the players. Everyone knew salaries were going to go up, but nobody, not the owners, players, or their agents, realized by how much. Players and agents also didn't factor in cost of living adjustments or inflation in their longer term contracts. Many players signed four or five year deals in the first few years of free agency where their salaries stayed the same for every year of the contract. This had the effect where those contracts were near the top in the league for the first year of the deal, but by the fifth year, they were making way less than their market value. The five longest free agent deals signed in 1977 show this. Reggie Jackson was the third highest paid player in the league when he signed his five-year deal, making almost seven times the league average salary. By the last year of his contract in 1981, he was only the 20th highest paid player in the league, making about three times league average salary. Bobby Gritch was the 15th highest paid player in 1977 when he signed his five-year deal, making 3.5 times the league average salary. In 1981, he was the 72nd highest paid player, making only 1.5 times the league average salary. There's a whole slew of examples like this. This wasn't helped by the fact that agents weren't as established or experienced as they are today. Today we have agencies with massive resources, with economic analysis departments that derive what a player should be worth, and negotiating ability to be able to properly counter teams' offers. Marvin Miller expressed frustration with the quality of player representation during this time period. I think that there are competent agents out there who have uh, been very good for the game in the sense that uh, they've taken constructive positions, they've represented the player, but with uh, some awareness of what they're doing in yes. relation to the game. There are others who are just plain inexperienced and uh, not competent. I'm worried about the agents because I can recall one of them. Uh, I'm in a saloon, I spent a lot of time in saloons, uh, and he's sitting next to the bar and says, you know, I just decided to become an agent today, yeah. and I got my first client. That's what I mean. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I, it scares me to death, oh. too. If you're representing somebody in salary arbitration, and the difference between the club's figure and the player's figure can be as much as $200,000, uh, you ought to be preparing for that case. Now, you don't have to be a genius to know that when the agent comes to our office the afternoon before the hearing and says, what do I do tomorrow? Yes, yes. You can he realize, isn't going to really... <laughs> yeah. Combine the first years of free agency with inexperienced agents and an unknown value for what players should be worth, and you get a lot of contracts and stories that are all over the place. For instance, in 1980, middle infielder Mike Edwards went to arbitration with the Oakland A's. Edwards filed for $50,000, but the A's filed for $58,000. This was the first instance where a player filed less than the team, something that shouldn't happen with a competent agent that is engaged with the team on salary negotiations prior to filing. Edwards ended up not going to arbitration because after the filings were made public, the team and Edwards came to an agreement. The salary details weren't disclosed, but there's a pretty good chance Edwards ended up with more than his $50,000 filing. This happened again in 1982. Pitcher Mike Flanagan was in discussion on a long-term deal with the Orioles, but they weren't able to come to an agreement prior to the arbitration filing deadline. Flanagan filed for $485,000, while the Orioles filed for $500,000. 
In this instance, the arbitrator canceled the case and rewarded Flanagan the $500,000. It ended up not mattering much in the end as Flanagan signed a five-year deal with the Orioles only a week later, notably with him making $500,000 the first year of the contract. It wasn't until 1981 where we saw the first major contract that contained a cost of living adjustment when Dave Winfield signed a 10-year deal with the Yankees. What's interesting about this contract is George Steinbrenner, owner of the Yankees, was unaware of the cost of living adjustment included in the contract. He thought he was signing Winfield to a 10-year deal for $16 million, when in reality it was a 10-year deal for about $25 million with the adjustment. Steinbrenner being fooled by this contract is one of the main reasons people speculate Steinbrenner had such an antagonistic relationship with Winfield for the duration of the contract. Even though Winfield was one of the best players for the Yankees throughout the 80s, Steinbrenner deridingly called him Mr. May for his poor World Series performance in 1981, a backhanded reference to Yankees legend Reggie Jackson's nickname of Mr. October. There were also some lawsuits that went back and forth between the parties in the late 80s, as Winfield sued the Yankees for not making payments to the Winfield Foundation, which was stipulated in the contract, and rumblings that the Yankees were going to sue the Winfield Foundation for misappropriation of funds, which is supposedly why they weren't making the payments. But things got really messy in 1990 when it was revealed Steinbrenner paid gambler Howard Spira $40,000 to find dirt on Winfield and proof of the misappropriation of funds, an action that got Steinbrenner banned from baseball for just over two years. There's also a bunch of weird contract stories from around this time period. I'm going to run through a few of them. In 1980, the Cardinals thought they were going to arbitration with pitcher Bob Forsch, but Forsch responded that he had sent the Cardinals his signed contract by registered mail three months earlier, and apparently it had gotten lost. The Cardinals quickly rewrote up the same contract and avoided arbitration with Forsch. In January of 1981, the Mets announced they had signed infielder Doug Flynn to a five-year contract. However, this was not true. Flynn had never signed the contract and refused to sign because of Clause 7B, which stated the contract could be voided if Flynn didn't display good citizenship or adhere to club rules, with Flynn arguing he didn't want his contract voided over something petty. That clause was in the uniform player's contract that the Players Association agreed to. Every player had that in their contract, and the grievance system rendered it relatively toothless, so it was an odd stance for Flynn to take. Mets general manager Frank Cashin claims it was Flynn's agent that created this holdup. Cashin stood his ground saying that he wasn't going to make concessions on a universal contract clause. After two months of delays, Flynn finally signed the original contract, including Clause 7B. In 1982, the Twins made a mistake with their contract offer to Rob Wilfong. After a pretty poor 1981, the Twins wanted to cut Wilfong by the maximum allowable amount of 20% and offered him $105,000. However, they forgot about an incentive performance in his previous contract that raised Wilfong's 1981 salary to $150,000, making their $105,000 offer a 30% cut, more than the CBA allowed. This opened the potential for Wilfong to file a grievance that would most likely be sustained, allowing him to immediately file for free agency, even though the Twins had two more years of control. The Twins' front office went into a panic and quickly negotiated a $600,000 three-year extension with Wilfong, paying him $200,000 in 1982, almost double what they were initially offering him. Another odd one was the contract extension pitcher Dan Quisenberry signed with the Royals in 1985. It was a four-year contract covering 1987 to 1990, but the really weird thing is it included 10 team option years going to the year 2000 and Quisenberry's age 47 season. None of the options ended up being picked up as the Royals cut him in 1989 and he retired after 1990. Even with all these weird stories, mistakes, and lackluster agent representation for the players, salaries were still going up at an astronomical rate with the introduction of free agency. Going into CBA negotiations in 1980, the owners had a goal to destroy free agency, but the players weren't going to capitulate without a fight. A spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview on Face the Nation with George Steinbrenner, owner of the New York Yankees, and Rusty Staub, first baseman for the New York Mets, and a member of the Baseball Players Negotiating Team.
The right of a ball player to play out his contract, become a free agent, was established by an arbitrator upheld by a court, period. In my opinion, we need compensation, and the, and the, and the draft choice is not enough. We need more compensation for a team that loses a player. The major problem of directly punishing a ball club for attempting to sign a free agent, therefore uh, taking away the, the basic ability of the free agent signing the kind of contract he would uh, without that penalty, uh, we have never broached that yet. Anytime it's ever brought up, you know, we, we're just on two different planets, as Mr. Grevy says. Uh, that there are some owners, no doubt about it, took a firm hard line this year and said, if we don't get what we want this time, we're going to hurt them. We're going to let them strike. We're going to force them to strike. There are some people that are no doubt about it in our mind trying to break the union. Here was the owner's plan to destroy free agency. Compensation. In effect, penalizing a team for signing a free agent. Their proposal in 1980 was a team signing a quality free agent would be able to protect 15 players on their 40-man roster. The team that lost the player would then be able to select any of the 25 remaining players. If you can only protect 15 players, what's left over could be some solid starters or promising prospects, most likely cost controlled as well. This means any team looking to sign a mid-level free agent would have to factor in potentially losing a player that's just as good with a significantly cheaper price tag. This would destroy the free agent market for all but the top tier guys, and would still factor in as a discount for those top tier guys. The players were not having it, and refused to show up for the first week of spring training, threatening a strike. With all the other aspects of the CBA agreed to, the owners agreed to table free agent compensation for a year, assigning a study group to look at different proposals. The 1980 season went underway as scheduled. The study group came back in January of 1981, supporting the owner's compensation proposal, one the players had consistently rejected. A deadline was set of June 1st for the players to agree to the owner's proposal. The only option was for the players to strike. What followed is what Marvin Miller described as the Players Association's finest hour. The players voted 967 to 1 to strike over the compensation issue, with the lone negative vote belonging to Jerry Terrell, who objected for religious reasons. A few player quotes on their decision. Rusty Staub, this is the easiest issue we've ever had to vote on. We recognize the gravity of the situation, but we know we're right and what they're asking is so easy to say no to. Ferguson Jenkins, of course I support the strike. We would be lost without the association. We're like a bunch of floundering idiots without it. Mike Marshall, we have to protect younger players, and in my opinion, we will. I think the stars understand that they have to pay back, in some measure, what others have won for them. I don't think they'll sell out, even though the sacrifice is going to be big. On June 12th, in the middle of the 1981 season, the players went on strike. The players' proposal did include some free agent compensation, but not directly coming from the team that signed the free agent. The team losing a player would be able to select a major league player from a pool of available players from all teams. Teams would be able to protect 26 players, with teams that signed a quality free agent only allowed to protect 24. The strike lasted over two months, when finally the owners reluctantly agreed to the players' proposal. In total, 713 games were canceled, the players lost close to $34 million in salaries, while the owners lost $72 million in revenue. The remainder of 1981 was played under a split-season format, where the first half-winner of a division would face a second half-winner of a division for a total of eight playoff teams. This had the weird side effect where the Cincinnati Reds had the best overall record in baseball, but didn't make the playoffs because they took second place in their division for both the first and second half of the season. The free agent compensation system put in place ended up being a massive dud. The only player of note that changed hands was Tom Seaver going from the Mets to the White Sox in 1984. The Mets had gambled that Seaver's contract was too expensive for any team to take and left him unprotected. This system took a massive hit in 1983. Tim Belcher, the Twins' first overall pick in the 1983 June Amateur Draft, didn't sign with the Twins. Entered the 1984 January Draft secondary phase, the draft was weird back in those days with a whole bunch of different drafts and phases, where the Yankees selected him. He signed with the Yankees, but after the free agent compensation draft protection deadline, allowing the Oakland A's to select Belcher in compensation for the Orioles signing free agent Tom Underwood. 
George Steinbrenner was so angry that he lost a first overall pick quality prospect through an odd series of events that he vowed to eliminate the compensation draft. With a high profile owner against the system and the players not liking it either, in 1985 the free agent draft compensation system was eliminated in favor of amateur draft pick compensation, which still exists to this day in some form. Ultimately, the owner's agenda to crush free agency in 1980 led to an eventual strike in 1981 that lost everyone money and had no lasting changes other than reinforcing the sentiment established in 1972 that the players could resist owner demands through a strike. The owners had tried multiple ways to kill free agency. First, by trying to uphold the reserve clause, which was shot down in the Messerschmitt-McNally decision in 1975. Then by making eligibility for free agency extremely limiting, which they lost the battle on that with the mass player holdout in 1976. They had tried again by proposing an overly punishing free agent compensation plan, which the players crushed with the 1981 strike. They had tried through arbitration and collective bargaining and failed. Now they were going to try something a little more devious. The main reason free agency drives player salaries up is you have multiple teams bidding on a player, driving the price up. Before free agency, the player had to stay with their original team and had no bargaining power. But what if no teams offer a free agent a contract other than the original team? It would end up being the same as the pre-free agency reserve clause system. If all the teams just agreed to not sign free agents, they would, in effect, render free agency useless. The only thing needed was to have all 30 teams on the same page. This happened with the election of Peter Uberoth as commissioner in 1984. At the first owners meeting after his election, Uberoth said it was not smart to sign players to long-term contracts and the owners were damned dumb for spending so much in free agency. The message was clear, stop bidding against each other on free agents. I'm going to let John Boyce describe a real example of this happening with Lonnie Smith prior to the 1987 season. This, very briefly, is how collusion works. Under normal circumstances, free agent Lonnie Smith can test the open market. Teams compete for his services, and that allows him to earn what the market says he's worth, right? But here, the owners gang up, and they say, hey, let's all agree to not compete with each other, all right? Let's, let's save some money that way. So they do Lonnie's old team a solid by refusing to make him any offers, and Lonnie has to come crawling back to his old team for far less money than he should have made. Smith not only ended up signing with the Royals, but his salary went from $1 million in 1986 to $500,000 in 1987. Andre Dawson is perhaps the most notorious example of collusion. After making just over a million dollars with the Expos in 1986, Dawson had no interest in re-signing with Montreal, but nobody was offering him a contract. Frustrated, Dawson gave the Chicago Cubs a blank check, saying he would sign for whatever the Cubs thought reasonable. The owners agreeing to not sign free agents is one thing, but a team passing up a deal like that for a future Hall of Famer would not only be dumb, but would provide indisputable evidence that the owners were colluding. The Cubs ended up signing Dawson for $500,000 base salary, a full 50% pay cut from the previous season, and Dawson went on to win National League MVP in 1987. Even today, Dawson is still bitter about this series of events and petitioned the Hall of Fame just last year to change his team cap on his plaque from the Expos to the Cubs. Dawson explained why he requested this change. This has toyed with me over the years for the simple reason that I was approached with the announcement that was going to be released to the press and I was going to wear an Expos emblem. I didn't agree with it at the time, but for me, getting into the Hall of Fame was the most important thing. Over time, I've thought about it more and came to the conclusion that I should have some say so. I personally feel my mission for the rest of my life going forward, if that's what it takes, is to right a wrong. Smith and Dawson were just scratching the surface. Free agent players talking amongst themselves in the offseason were quick to realize that this was a widespread problem. Looking at a historical graph of the percent of free agents that signed with their original team, you can see a significant spike from 1985 to 1988, where all four years are more than 5% higher than any other year. In the 1977 CBA, it was established that owners were not allowed to collude, something the owners agreed to in exchange for players also not being allowed to collude, a response to the Koufax-Drysdale holdout. 
They were in clear violation of this, and the Players Association filed three grievances against the league. One in 1986, one in 1987, and one in 1988. It wasn't hard for the players to provide a mountain of evidence and testimony, making it clear that the owners were blatantly colluding, resulting in the arbitrator ruling in favor of the players for all three grievances and forcing the owners to pay $280 million to go to the players that lost money, which was a list dozens of players long. Notably, the owners weren't charged any additional penalties, only what was calculated as the direct losses to free agents from collusion. There's another little wrinkle to this. It's commonly accepted that the owners colluded from 1985 to 1987 because of these rulings, and most people believe 1988 as well, but this was blatant, obvious collusion where teams just weren't offering free agents any contracts. There's some evidence that collusion may have even happened earlier. Here's a Marvin Miller interview from 1982. Do you think there is collusion? Oh yes, yes, I, there's not much doubt about it. Uh, let me not bore you with all Don't you, of you. Please, you're not going to bore me up because right. you understand I wasn't in last year's meetings. Well, I think you, you have to start with, uh, let's say, Iran Guidry. Uh, 17 clubs obtained negotiating rights, plus the Yankees. But no club offers more, either in years of contract or money, than the Yankees offer prior to the reentry draft. Now, first of all, they're not even supposed to know about that offer. But nobody beats that offer. And consider now, uh, 17 clubs with very different circumstances. Now, I don't have to tell you that no two people in baseball will agree exactly on what a player is worth. Uh, well, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's really an scientific. indeterminate figure, yes. Right. So among the 17 clubs, let's take, uh, and, and these are real cases, let's take a club with a great starting rotation. Now, the addition of a fine left-handed starting pitcher like Guidry would be helpful, but not that helpful. In the case of the White Sox, for instance. Right, right. Now you shift to a club, great hitting team, and needing pitching badly. Same value, same offer, same three years. Take a club that's a seller club. The addition of a Guidry would be helpful, but not crucial. And then you compare that with one of the 17 clubs, a real contender needing just a little to push him over the top and pitch it. Same value as the seller club offers. Uh, quite impossible. The three years, they offer all free agents three years, whether the free agent's 28 years old or 38 years old, whether he has a history of injury or whether he's been remarkably injury free, whether you're a club that continues to sign other players to five, six, and eight years, or whether you're not. Everybody offers three years, and they would have you believe that the 26 owners woke up one morning and they looked in the mirror and each independently said, I think this year it'll be three-year offers. I didn't do that. I, I said, one year. <laughs> That's all I could afford. <laughs> if it's 1982, Miller is stating he believed there was collusion in the 1981 offseason. Remember this chart? Let's bring it back to before 1982. 1981 was by far the highest percentage of free agents to sign with their original team that has ever happened in the history of baseball. Marvin Miller might be right here. The feeling that surrounds this baseball strike is different than those of the past. In the past, people were annoyed and even angered, but they still were hopeful. Now I sense that people have been alienated. I don't say that it's permanent, but I say it'll be longer lasting for many people. Now, leaving aside who is primarily to blame, I think the average person says, look, they got a couple of billion dollars in this industry. They've had at least two years to know that this was coming. They can't figure out how to divide the spoils here, and both parties don't have enough concern for the future of the institution to compromise here. Nobody has any creative ideas. Come on. That the Players Association, for all their great gains, for all of the intellect and integrity shown by their leaders through the years, can at times be too doctrinaire. They sometimes sound like they're storming the Bastille or something. Uh, these parties don't trust each other, and neither one wants to make uh, much of a step this time around in, in the other's direction. You, in fact, believe that the issues that divide them are not as important as the 
attitude they have about each other that divides right. them. Mistrust is a greater factor here I than salary so. cap or salary arbitration. Yeah, because if that history, that badly scarred history didn't exist, creative minds would sit down and they would come up with some kind of mechanism. It wouldn't have to be a salary cap. They would discuss their differences and their very real and significant common interests and they'd come up with something. Have They've had both, years to do it. Have both sides acted in good faith? Well, the players would tell you that the owners have not. The players would tell you uh, they tend to be historically uh, suspicious of, of the owners. They would tell you that the owners never really intended to come off the salary cap because they had the legal right to impose their last offer in the offseason if they declare uh, an impasse in the bargaining, and so that was their intention. And uh, many people connected with the union think that it was their intention to break the union and see if the players crack if they take this into next season. A whirlwind of issues converged in 1994. The players were still angry at the owners over collusion, which was only compounded when the owners forced out Faye Vincent as commissioner of baseball in favor of owner Bud Selig. Vincent was an aberrationist, probably the most pro-player commissioner in the history of the sport. He may have single-handedly avoided a strike in 1990, as his main goal was to make negotiations less antagonistic between the players and owners, and pushing both sides to compromise. As shown in the previous hour and change in this video, negotiating in good faith and compromising was something that did not really exist in the previous 24 years of MLB labor negotiations. The owners not only forcing Vincent out, but replacing him with an owner, an owner with heavy ties to the collusion scandal, was not well received by players. Some will say that the owners are exactly where they plan to do, that they had a plan. And the plan began with taking you out as commissioner. Well, I think and that's, that's right. I think that's correct. What do you mean? Well, I think that um, the owners really wanted to confront the union, and they didn't want a commissioner who might interfere and use his powers, either legal powers or persuasive powers. And so I think this was uh, a function of the fight in 90, where I did get involved and did help to get things resolved. And I think after that, the owners said, uh, we really want to have the confrontation and we want to control it ourselves. I mean, that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, the one thing you don't want is a commissioner there who might uh, interfere. So I think it was planned and I think it is inevitable. The owners like the fact that one of them is in charge and, and there aren't going to be surprises and there's not going to be a commissioner doing things that they don't agree with. On top of that, there was the lingering issue of local television revenue that had to be resolved. Marvin Miller even discussed this 12 years prior to the 94 strike. What is going to happen now if cable and, tele and pay are as, as lucrative as some people say, mm -hmm. then the difference between the wealthy clubs and the poor clubs, or that is the difference between the clubs in large population areas and small, will become even more disproportionate, won't it? But I think your general uh, thesis is correct, that uh, unless there is more sharing of that kind of income, um, there will be a, a widening of the gap, yes. There was still no sharing of local television revenue between the teams going into 1994, meaning there was a massive revenue disparity between the teams. This was further exasperated by a sudden drop in national TV revenue, which was shared among the teams in the early 90s. With the bad blood between the owners and players, an owner now acting as commissioner, and some financial uncertainty, the conditions were set for the ugliest labor fight in baseball history. The owner's proposal was revealed in June of 1994. It was a salary cap set at $33 million with a salary floor set to guarantee the players a 50-50 split of revenue with the owners. Teams never opened their books to the public or to the players, so this 50-50 split was on a trust me bro type of agreement. My question is, why couldn't they, if they are hurting, if they wanted cost certainty, what prevented them from opening up the books and making their case to the American people and say, we need some kind of cost control because this is the status of our game. Look at this team, look at this team, yeah. look at this team. Why wouldn't they do that? Well, they did have a joint study committee. Yeah, but they didn't release the information. And they even swore Don Fear to secrecy as he sort of right and I, th I think they should have been more open about this they, they have done they didn't make their case they have done a terrible job making their case to the press and the public 
They also proposed to completely get rid of salary arbitration, with the one concession being players would be eligible for free agency at four years instead of six, but with the original team getting the right of first refusal for years five and six, meaning their former club could retain them if they matched any free agent offer. There would also be massively increased revenue sharing between the teams. This might sound kind of familiar for those of you that are football fans, as this is very close to how the NFL operates. The NBA, we offered them what the NBA has, we offered them what the NFL has, we offered them what uh, Ushery, we were willing to accept Ushery's package. They turned it all down. So why don't we, the ownership, get at least some credit for what we have tried to do in this contest? However, the NFL is very different in that all television money is already national and not regional, so shared amongst the teams. And ticket sales are a much smaller portion of NFL revenue than it is for MLB revenue. It's easier to have a widespread revenue sharing plan with a salary cap when team revenues are already pretty even. What you have today is an industry where the payrolls of, of a number of teams exceed the total revenues of some of the smaller market teams, and that just doesn't work. There has to be a combination of reshuffling or redistributing revenue sharing within no. the club. First, and, and, right. But the players I, ask, why take it from us? Why don't you okay. share it among the, the owners? Should also note that Major League Baseball has historically had a much stronger players union than the NFL. So reverting to an NFL style of salary cap and revenue sharing would be a step back for the players. The Players Association outright rejected the offer, and with no discussions or negotiations happening on the proposal, said they would strike mid-season if no progress was made. On August 12, 1994, the players officially went on strike, and the remainder of the season and postseason was officially canceled by Bud Selig on September 14th, as even with the strike, no progress was made at the negotiating table between the owners and the players. It can't be understated how this is one of the worst chapters in baseball history. The World Series was canceled for the first time since it was established as an annual event in 1905. All of the compelling storylines for the 1994 season, including the Expo's potential first division crown and possible World Series, Tony Gwynn's chances at a 400 batting average season, and Matt Williams' chase of Roger Maris' home run record stopped dead in their tracks. Things did not get better in the offseason. Seemingly no progress was made as each side was dug into their position. But I think anybody who gets in the move, whether it's Mr. Ussery or or you will find that there's a lot more going on here than just a fight over money. This is a long moral battle. Not wanting to miss out on revenue for the 1995 season, the owners had approved their own version of the CBA with a salary cap and plans to use replacement players. This caused a number of issues. Orioles owner Peter Angelos flatly refused to use replacement players, most likely rooted in his background as a labor trial lawyer and possibly influenced by Cal Ripken's games played streak, which would end if the season started with replacement players. And Ripken was only 121 games away from matching Lou Gehrig's streak of 2,130 consecutive games. Tigers manager Sparky Anderson refused to coach replacement players and was placed on unpaid leave by the team. The Blue Jays were subject to an Ontario labor law, meaning replacement players couldn't play in the province. We'd probably see something similar to 2020 where the Blue Jays played their games at an alternate site in the States. If the 1995 season had started with replacement players, it would have been messy. The end of the strike did not come from an agreement between the players and owners. Instead, it came from federal court as the Players Association filed a complaint with the National Relations Labor Board against Major League Baseball for unfair labor practices for illegally removing free agency and salary arbitration during negotiations. I said before, the owners approved their own collective bargaining agreement containing their proposal. But just the definition of what a collective bargaining agreement is, that should raise some alarm bells that one side just approved and instituted a plan on their own. Just like the Holy Roman Empire not being holy, nor Roman, nor an empire, this collective bargaining agreement was neither collective, nor bargained, nor an agreement. And sure enough, it did not pass muster with labor law. On March 30th, future Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor issued a preliminary injunction against Major League Baseball, preventing them from using the new collective bargaining agreement they had pushed through, as well as preventing them the use of replacement players. On April 2nd, only one day before the season was scheduled to start with replacement players, the injunction was upheld by the Court of Appeals. This meant 
the strike was over and the season would be played under the expired 1990 CBA. Most of us, Bob Costas on this broadcast said the same thing, thought that the owners were in control, that they were on the five yard line, you know, with four downs to go. What happened? In this negotiation? Yeah, I mean, why did all of a sudden we end up when it looked like, you know, the owners to use another sport were, you know, going for a slam dunk? Well, the, the Greeks had uh, something called the deus ex machina that came in in uh, Greek uh, drama or tragedy and saved uh, one party or the other from devastation. And in this case, uh, the federal court stepped in and really sent the parties uh, back to the starting line, if you will. And that's really what intervened. I, I do think that the tide was moving in favor of the owners were it not for this injunction that the judge issued. They, they clearly, it's not the last two or three weeks, I think it's the action that they took back in January, whenever it was when they, when they changed the work rules that was found to have been not in good faith. So w whether we characterize that as stupid or, or wrong or whatever adjective we, we use, it is what it is. And the judge found that it was not good faith bargaining and sent them back to status quo. Nothing was changed or gained by either side. The status quo was maintained, and all that happened was the owners lost $1 billion in revenue, the players lost $400 million in salaries, and fans were royally pissed off. In, what, eight lockouts or eight strikes, eight work stoppages now, um, I think most people will agree that the, the players have won all, all the way down the line. They've won in, in for arbitration, they've won the anti-collusion, the collusion business, they've won all, all of it. And the reason I think that the owners are stupid is they feel all along this, all, in all this time, that they can muscle the players' union and use every tactic, every scheme, every scam they can. And it hasn't worked. One day they should wake up, I, I would hope, and say, look, Let's bargain fairly with these people. If nothing changed due to the 1994-1995 strike and nothing was resolved, how the heck did we get labor peace in baseball for the next 26 years? After being critical of the owners for their labor negotiation practices for most of this video, I'll throw them a bone here. They realized a couple of things. Blatantly breaking labor laws was not a winning strategy. Starting a season without a CBA in place was asking for disaster, and because they were now going to follow labor laws, negotiating in good faith was kind of a requirement. Also, the 1995 season saw a significant decrease in attendance and revenue, so constantly pissing off fans with demands that would lead to a strike was bad for business. For the 1996 CBA, they submitted a much more digestible proposal a luxury tax instead of a hard salary cap, and increased revenue sharing between the teams. They also added a provision that the owners and players would jointly ask Congress to eliminate baseball special antitrust exemption with respect to labor matters, but not fully remove the antitrust exemption, of course. This led to the Curt Flood Act of 1998. Other reasons for the extended labor peace was the financial impact of lowered national TV revenue did not play as big of a factor as the owners feared. MLB revenues doubled from 1995 to 2000. After the lackluster attendance in the 1995 season, MLB attendance rebounded to 1992 levels by 1997 and continued to increase to an all-time high in 2007. Some of this can be attributed to the increased national interest due to the Maguire-Sosa home run race in 1998, as well as increased offensive numbers during the steroid era, but I personally believe arguments that the steroid era saved baseball are a bit overstated. The excitement from two expansion teams, the Marlins and Rockies, in 1993, as well as the Rockies constantly selling out the cavernous Mile High Stadium, inflated attendance numbers in 1993 and 1994 making the drop-off in 1995 look way more dramatic than it actually was. The Rockies could sell out every game in Coors Field in 2023, and they'd still be a half million short of the attendance they had in 1993. Yeah, the strike stopped some positive momentum, but baseball wasn't dead. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! The introduction of the Diamondbacks and Devil Rays in 1998 had a similar boost to attendance. The players were also happy because after stagnating briefly in the mid-90s, league average salary again shot up in the late 90s and early 2000s. Local TV contracts ballooned in value during this time as well. The labor strife from the 60s through the 90s derived from either players wanting common sense labor rights or from a shift of how revenue was earned, 
for instance, going from national TV contracts to local. Post-1996 CBA, there was somewhat of a status quo reached. Changes to the CBA after this were mostly minor issues, raising the league minimum salary each negotiating cycle to keep up with increasing league revenues, patching up loopholes in the CBA, instituting a performance-enhancing drug testing system in response to the steroid era, introducing international amateur signing bonus limits, establishing amateur draft signing bonus slot amounts, and other issues that weren't really front page news. What's interesting is negotiating in good faith might have been the better strategy for the owners from the beginning. All of the things I've covered in this video up to and including the 94 strike had a common storyline. The owners make unreasonable demands, act antagonistic to the players, and don't engage in negotiations. The players get angry at this and unite even more to the point where their resolve in holding out or striking was stronger than the unity among the owners. Imagine if in 1973, seeing the writing on the wall, the owners had negotiated to abolish the reserve clause in exchange for free agency being at eight years instead of six. Since the Players Association had abolishing the reserve clause as one of their top priorities, they would have jumped at this deal, making the end result much more favorable to the owners. This would have avoided the lockout in 76, the strike in 81, the collusion of the late 80s, and a strategy like this may have even averted the 94 strike. This strategy of negotiating in good faith also arguably lulled the Players Association to sleep. After the baseball boom of the late 90s and early 2000s, salary increases did not keep pace with league revenue. From 2001 to 2019, league revenue increased by 190%. The league average salary only increased by 105%. During the six year period of 2017 to 2022, league average salary actually decreased. Since 1975, the only time league average salary decreased over a multi-year time frame was the three year period of 1994 to 1996. And that was because the strike caused the old CBA to be renewed, so league minimum salaries stayed the same, and owners, reeling from the financial impact of the strike, didn't have as much cash on hand in 1995 and 1996 for big free agent deals. 1997 saw a predictable course correction as it was the largest percent increase in league average salary over the past 30 years. The Players Association was out of practice on fighting battles and taking a stand, and very slowly, over a 15 year period where you wouldn't even notice year over year, the massive gains they had made were becoming stagnant. It would require an unprecedented event to shock the Players Association back to life. This is what a nasty labor dispute looks like. And the way that it has taken the twists and the turns, the way that they have not talked to each other, but talked past one another, it's like they're negotiating completely different agreements at this point. And that's why we're finding ourselves, Steve, where we are in the middle of June with no agreement in place, no spring training in sight, and no beginning of the season set and really no idea if or when baseball is going to be played. We all know what happened in 2020. I don't think I need to go into detail on why things were shaken up a bit. Labor conflicts really get amped up to 11 when either there's a massive change, like the abolishment of the reserve clause in 1975, or financial uncertainty. The start of the season being canceled in 2020, with no idea of when things would ramp back up, created a lot of financial uncertainty. Revenues went to zero overnight, and there were a lot of issues that had to get figured out before play resumed. Questions that immediately came to the forefront. When would play resume? What would be the season and playoff format? Would players get their normal salaries for the part of the season that was canceled? Would they get paid their normal salaries when play resumed to games in empty stadiums with no ticket sales? How is service time addressed? What rules need to be put in place to keep players safe when play resumed? What would happen if a team came down with COVID after play resumed? In a year where there wasn't supposed to be any CBA negotiations between the owners and players association, things went into overdrive and got messy quickly. The biggest disagreement was how long would the season be and how much would the players get paid? The owner's stance was they would lose money on any regular season games played in an empty stadium, but playoff TV money is lucrative regardless, and players don't make a salary in the playoffs, only a portion of revenue, so the owner still wanted a season to get that juicy playoff money, just with as short of a regular season as possible while paying the players as little as possible. The players agreed to have their salaries prorated pretty early, but they wanted full pay for any games that were played, so the players wanted a longer regular season. 
As late as May 31st, the Players Association was still proposing a 114 game season, almost double the end result of a 60 game season. The owners initially started with an 82 game season proposal with a 50-50 revenue split between owners and players instead of the players' normal contracts, but since owners are already pretty secretive of their revenue numbers and have good accountants, there wasn't any guarantee that a split like that would be even close to what the players would make with fully prorated contracts. So that was a dead in the water proposal for the Players Association. Major League Baseball says the revenues coming in this year are projected to be only about 2.75 or so billion dollars. The players do not believe that number. They have asked for documentation to back it up. The league has provided some documentation. The players have said, no, it's not enough. It's redacted too much. It doesn't tell us what we want to know. The owners eventually amended this to a sliding compensation scale where players who earn the most will be asked to take a larger pay reduction than those who make less. Again, the Players Association said they would only agree to fully prorated salaries. Really, when the season would start back up and how long the season would be was not related to when things would be safe from a COVID aspect. Instead, it was a calculation by the owners of how late they could delay to get as short of a regular season as possible with fully prorated salaries for the players while still getting playoff money. That proved to be 60 games. Note that the Players Association and owners never came to an official agreement. Every proposal the owners made, the Players Association voted no. Every proposal the Players Association made, the owners said no. With no agreement, in the end, Commissioner Manfred mandated a 60-game season with full prorated salaries, and even though the Players Association had rejected a 60-game proposal from the owners the day before, they announced they would comply with Manfred's mandate. While a season was played, no official agreement was ever made. When the CBA set to expire after the 2021 season, 2020 was a sneak peek into what would happen in 2022. I guess it'd be a bad time to ask you about future labor peace, and, and so I, I won't do that uh, going <laughs> forward, man. I already discussed how salaries were not keeping pace with league revenue, but combined with the combative nature of the 2020 negotiations, the owners were aware that they were in for a fight in 2022 and unanimously voted to preemptively lock out the league on December 2nd. Unlike past lockouts and strikes, there really wasn't one large issue that this lockout was over, but instead about a half a dozen smaller ones. The overall biggest issue for the players was to increase salaries at a faster rate than they had in the past 15 years. And it was a number of smaller items combined that would achieve this. What the players wanted, significantly raised minimum salary, earlier arbitration eligibility, two years of service time, a bonus pool given to pre-arbitration players in line with their production, a salary floor for teams, getting rid of draft pick compensation for free agents, elimination of service time manipulation, a draft lottery to discourage tanking because tanking teams tend to spend quite a bit less, and free agency based on age and not service time. What the owners wanted, a salary cap. I should note that the salary floor and salary cap discussions were ditched pretty quickly because the owners wouldn't accept a salary floor without a cap and the players would never agree to a cap. So in lieu of this, higher luxury tax penalties with an added tier, expanded playoffs, an international draft, and later arbitration eligibility, essentially removal of Super 2. There were also smaller items related to rule changes like the pitch clock, larger bases, eliminating the shift, etc. But these were issues where there wasn't much disagreement and not a focus in the negotiations. The international draft was proposed at the last minute by the owners and ditched pretty quickly. Probably not a serious proposal anyway, and instead introduced to just gauge the players' reactions. Outside of that, most of the issues were down to strict numbers. The initial proposals from each side. Minimum salary, the owners proposed 600,000, the players 775,000. Pre-arbitration bonus pool, the owners initially proposed none while the players wanted 115 million. Luxury tax levels, the owners wanted to set the first level at 214 million while the players wanted to set it at 245 million. The owners also wanted to add a fourth punishment tier at $60 million over the luxury tax, referred to as the Steve Cohen tax. Size of expanded playoffs, the owners wanted 14 teams, the players wanted 12. Number of teams in the lottery draft, the owners wanted three, the players wanted seven. Number of players credited with a full season of service time or draft pick compensation for their teams if they called them up on opening day. The owners only wanted the winners of Rookie of the Year, MVP or Cy Young, 
While the players wanted the top two for Rookie of the Year to get full service time and draft pick compensation for the top three in Rookie of the Year, top five for Cy Young, and top five for MVP. The end agreement was the following. Minimum salary was set at $700,000. The pre-arbitration bonus pool was set at $50 million. The first luxury tax level was set at $230 million. Expanded playoffs were set at 12 teams, and the number of teams in the draft lottery was set at six. In the end, the players did make some gains towards increasing overall salaries. The league average salary increase from 2022 to 2023 was the second largest since 2001. But it remains to be seen if that's just a one-year boost, or if salaries will continue to go up during the effective period of this CBA, which I think will be a major barometer if the 2027 CBA negotiations are combative or amiable. There's also a few issues that the players had as priorities that weren't addressed, most notably draft pick compensation for free agents that were offered a qualifying offer. The Players Association had been trying to get that removed for years, but again, it was not addressed as the owners tied that in return for an international draft. What is noteworthy is right before the end of the lockout, the player representatives of the Players Association wanted to continue to negotiate and extend the lockout, but received pushback from many players, ultimately putting it to a vote for each team. Many players were sick of the standstill and just wanted to get back to baseball, and the final vote to end the lockout was 26 to 12. Note that the 26 yes votes were all teams, and of the 12 no votes, four were teams, the Mets, Cardinals, Yankees, and Astros, and eight were the Players Association executives unanimously voting to not take the deal. There's been a lot of changes in the last few years in regards to contracts. First, there's been a massive rise in lengthy pre-arbitration extensions for players. Eight to 10 year deals for a player in their early 20s didn't really happen prior to 2018, with the closest being Albert Pujols with his seven year deal back in 2004. But now they're all over the place. Not to mention the 11 to 14 year deals which were non-existent before, but now we have Fernando Tatis Jr., Julio Rodriguez, Bobby Witt Jr., and Wander Franco all signing deals of that length. Free agent contracts have been a bit of a mixed bag. The top tier free agents are signing larger and longer contracts than ever. Otani, Yamamoto, Bogarts, Turner, Harper, Machado, including some duds like Anthony Rendon and Steven Strasburg, but mid to upper level free agents aren't seeing even close to the same deals. Notably with this recent offseason seeing Snell, Chapman, Bellinger, and Montgomery all falling well short of their expectations and instead signing short-term deals. A lot of this can be attributed to uncertainty regarding the future of regional sports networks and local television revenue for teams, which, if that isn't resolved, could lead to another tough CBA negotiation session for 2027. There's also some unique challenges for the Players Association. Recently, the minor leagues unionized and officially joined the Players Association, which is a good thing as rights and pay for minor leaguers had stagnated to near criminal levels, only seeing decent improvements in the past few years. But their addition does bring some disagreement among the Players Association's ranks. As I'm writing this, there's a bit of turmoil as Players Association members are pushing for the removal of their chief labor negotiator, Bruce Meyer, and replace him with Harry Marino, the lawyer who led the unionizing efforts of the minor leaguers. It will be interesting to see if the league average salaries keep pace with league revenue over the next four years. Hopefully it does and leads to a relatively peaceful negotiation session in 2027. But if it doesn't, we could be in for a rough ride. Regardless of what happens, the Players Association will undoubtedly be looking out for the best interest of the players. After all, through decades of work and history, we've gone from this to this. The union forever defending our rights, down with the blacklist.